Welcome to this edition of Buncombe Life. Well, let me ask you, do you know anything about stroke? Would you know if you were having one? Would you know if someone you were with was having one? Think you're too young? Think again. Think you're too healthy? Think again. Come with us as we go to Mission Hospital and we find out more about stroke. They're gonna tell us how to spot one, how to know if you're having one, and then they're gonna show us how a robot could help save your life. Come on. Okay, I'm here at Mission uh, with Robin Jones, who is the stroke coordinator for yes. Mission, mm -hmm. right? And we, I have got a list of questions <laughs> about stroke. Uh, it's something that when, when somebody says to me, I've had a stroke, or I think I'm going to have a stroke, you know, people use that kind of as slang. But when I really think of it, I think of somebody old. I mm -hmm. think of uh, somebody who's in their 70s, 80s. Uh, that, that's kind of a, a heart condition that they deal with, mm -hmm. and that's not right. Right. So tell me, <laughs> first of all, what is a stroke? Well, I'm so glad that you're here today and that you're asking these questions because it's, um, it's vitally important that people understand um, how to reduce their risk of a stroke, how to recognize the warning signs of a stroke, and how to seek help immediately. All of us. All of us, yeah. yes. And stroke, if you want to think about it um, in a layman's terms, I would think a brain attack. Okay. So, um, and many people know what to do if they think someone's having a heart attack. Right. They respond emergently, they call 911. Well, in a stroke, it is an attack in the brain within the brain uh, blood vessels. And there are two types of strokes. Mm -hmm. There's a hemorrhagic or a, a blood vessel that ruptures, um, causing head. bleeding into the brain. Yeah. Yes. And um, that's about 20% of all strokes are caused by a rupture of a blood vessel. Mm -hmm. The other 80%, so the more common type of a stroke, is something called ischemic, and that's lack of blood flow. And that um, can be due to a blockage of, a, of an artery or a blood vessel like a blood from, a, from blood clot. Okay. Um, it can also be due to narrowing um, of the blood vessel due to atherosclerosis. You know, we hear a little bit about that. 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 Mm -hmm. And so, that's, I think, older people, you know, that's where that older people thing comes in. These clog up. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And you can also have um, blockages in the smaller blood vessels in the brain. Um, you know, it is typically an older disease. Mm -hmm. um, we see it our risk of having a stroke increases as we age. But the number one actually risk associated or that would increase your chances of having a stroke mm -hmm. is uncontrolled high blood pressure. Okay. So really knowing your numbers, or um, the doctor may call it hypertension. Mm -hmm. So if a, um, getting your blood pressure checked, your um, typical blood pressure should be less than 120 over 80. Mm -hmm. If it's not, and you chronically run at a higher blood pressure, it does damage over time mm -hmm. to the inside of the blood vessel walls. Right. Um, another, more, uh, another common risk factor or cause of stroke is something called atrial fibrillation. Mm -hmm. And that's an irregular heartbeat. Um, your heart is, is a muscle mm -hmm. with two upper chambers and two lower chambers. Mm -hmm. and it's run by an electrical system. Mm -hmm. Well, with atrial fibrillation, the electrical impulse has gone haywire. <laughs> so it's basically, instead of pumping on a, on a regular steady beat, right. the upper chambers are actually fibrillating. Yeah, it's it a little crazy. It's a little crazy. Yeah. And how that relates to stroke is that then the pump doesn't work effectively. Right. So because of that, blood will pool in the ventricles or the lower chambers and form clots. And when you go in and out of that rhythm, you can actually eject or send a clot out through the blood vessel system. Throw a clot. Throw a clot. I've heard that. Yes, yeah. and it travels as far downstream as it can go, yeah. and then it dams up. So it goes through the blood vessel system, and it goes into the brain where it actually it has to, it stops at some narrow junction. Right. And then the brain on the back side of that clot right. begins to die. That's the stroke. Other things that increase your risk of having a stroke or a brain attack would be the very, very typical risk factors for heart disease. So diet, so high cholesterol, um, having a uh, 
uh, LDL that's too high. Mm -hmm. So you want to really focus on that. And LDL is the bad cholesterol. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I teach patients that when you think about cholesterol, you think about um, an HDL is what you want to be good. Mm -hmm. So you want your good cholesterol to be high. high. And you want your LDL, your lousy cholesterol, to be low. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> and that's really through diet and exercise. Right. Very similar message to, to heart to disease. Heart. So, and, and, we, and if the folks at home that watch our channel know, we've talked a lot about heart. Mm -hmm. And knowing your numbers was yes. something that we pushed. Well, guess what? Knowing your numbers, numbers for stroke is just as important. Just as important. And um, the other thing I would will have to say is that, you know, another thing that puts you at high risk of having a brain attack would be tobacco use. Mm -hmm. Um, smoking, but I also say tobacco use because I know a lot of the people in our region like to use other forms of tobacco. Mm -hmm. They dip and they chew, and um, that increases the risk of, of blood vessel disease. So um, it's not that it's affecting the lungs, mm -hmm. but it's affecting your blood vessels. Right. So smoking and tobacco use is a, is a big risk factor. Mm -hmm. I recently read a statistic from the National Stroke Association that said that stroke affects more women than breast cancer, ovarian cancer, and uterine cancer combined. Oh no. So there are... Please um, tell me it's not true. It is true. <laughs> there are um, almost 800,000 strokes a year, um, and many of those are preventable. If you know your numbers and take the precautions that your doctor gives right. you. So, But many times, even if you know your numbers and you're very healthy and you do the precautions, mm -hmm. you can still yes. have a stroke. Yes. You can still have a stroke, and um, uh, we want to make sure people know the warning signs of a stroke. Yes, so definitely. So we teach um, something called Think Fast. Mm -hmm. So we ask people to, if I thought you were having a stroke, right. I'd say, Kathy, will you smile for me? And I can. And, and, I, and I want, what I'm looking for is to see if I see a facial droop or mm -hmm. asymmetry of the face. Mm -hmm. And then I would say, will you raise your arms up for me? Mm -hmm. And if she, can't, if she can't raise an arm or if an arm keeps dropping down, right. Oh my gosh, that's not her normal. Let me call 911. Right. And then the S is for speech. So I'll okay. ask you to say something back to me. And if your speech was not normal, no speech, if you sounded very slurred, right. if you were making up words like that didn't make any sense and that was not your normal, then I <laughs> then the T stands for time. Time yeah. to call 911. Time to look at your watch. Because if I witnessed you having this, it would be very important information to give the paramedics. When did that, it start? When did it start? Or they may, they'll ask questions, when was the last time you know, yeah. this person was without these symptoms? When were they last seen normal? So those are important. That's important information for the yeah. paramedics. Let's repeat those one more time. So just, you need to write this down. Mm -hmm. Look at, it's fast, face, it's, see if they can smile. Mm -hmm. Arms. arms. Mm -hmm. See if they can and hold them right. up. Arm or leg weakness. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then speech. Each. Get them to say something. Tell them to repeat a word. If any of that doesn't work, call 911. Right. You know, calling 911, getting trained paramedics, getting a truck, they can actually start your stroke care mm -hmm. on the way to the hospital. They can okay. check your vital signs. They can have you on a heart monitor. They can start your IV mm -hmm. that we can use to give the drug. Right. But you, um, they can't give the drug. It's an important thing to understand is that yeah. because of those two types of strokes, yeah. we don't know whether you're having a bleeding stroke or a, an ischemic stroke. Right. So you have to get to the hospital to have a CT scan. Right. And uh, also the paramedics give us a heads up notification. So the EMS will call the hospital on the way here mm -hmm. and say we're bringing in a code stroke. And that activates a whole team response here at Mission Hospital mm -hmm. to, um, to have the physician, uh, the CT techs ready, waiting on the patient, the emergency department staff is ready to go. Yeah. You know, because again, every minute matters. Every minute counts. Yes. Every minute counts. Mm -hmm. And Mission is doing something really cool the telehealth yes. and telestroke and the robot. Yes. <laughs> and we're going to talk in just a minute mm -hmm. with uh, Dr. Schneider and see the robot. Absolutely. And that plays a big role. In, in how you guys can help this whole Western North Carolina. That is a, that's the goal, is to actually reduce the time to treatment. Stay with us. Now I'm going to introduce you to someone. Um, this is a little unconventional, but it's the coolest thing. You're going to love this. Uh, you need to meet Dr. Snyder. And if he could come in and join us, that would be wonderful.
Okay. Hello. Hello. It, it's freaking me out a little. I got to get a little used to it. This is the robot. This is Dr. Schneider. Could you tell us, by way of the robot, what, what is this thing? I am uh, on our telehealth uh, uh, robotics platform, and I am uh, controlling the robot. I can turn my head here and look at Robin. I can look at you. And um, I uh, uh, controlled the robot to come into the room. Uh, so I'm at a uh, laptop uh, uh, remotely. I can either be at my home or in, a, in the uh, hospital here and uh, see a patient at some other hospital where we have a robot stationed. So anywhere pretty much in Western North Carolina you could you could be here at Mission, and the robot would be in that hospital. That's right. Right now we have uh, seven robots in uh, various emergency departments in Western North Carolina. Wow. Now, tell us, in just a few minutes, Dr. Schneider is going to join us with his real person. <laughs> Dr. Schneider is going to join us. But he's going to come in here. But tell me kind of what the robot would do. Let's say that I'm the patient and I need to be assessed. What would this robot would come into the room, and then what would happen? Well, uh, the uh, emergency physician would identify a potential stroke victim at an outlying uh, emergency room and then contact us and then um, I would log on to our uh, laptop here at our hospital and then control the robot to go into the patient's room and then I would directly evaluate them, take a history, uh, do a uh, basic neurologic exam to, to try to get an assessment as to whether or not A, are they having a stroke and B, if it is a stroke, is it something that we can treat effectively with, with uh, emergent therapies that we have to offer? Well, now my question is, okay, you come in and I understand how you could talk to the patient because we're talking here and, and I can almost forget that you're not really here, but there's no arms on this thing. So how do you do an assessment of a patient other than just seeing them remotely? Well, I can zoom in so I could look at uh, data like blood pressure and stuff and you can actually see me zooming in on the screen there. Yeah, you can see us down here in the corner. Exactly, and I can, I can you know, for instance, I can do a fast exam. Can you smile for me? And so, exactly, and now I can look to see if there's any facial weakness. I can ask you to hold your arms up. Can you hold your arms up? and to see if there's any drift or weakness on one side. And I, we usually would have a, a nursing staff or other physician at that uh, remote site in the room helping me. I might ask them to uh, check for visual fields or uh, to uh, ask them to make the patient do uh, various things that I could then observe to see if there's uh, some significant neurologic deficit that would go along with the stroke. Cool. So that would really assist uh, that hospital in making the assessment of the patient. That's right. The way I look at it is, is uh, you know, th there's a shortage of specialists across the United States, certainly a shortage of neurologists, and then when you talk about stroke specialists, there's, a, there's an even greater shortage, shortage of us. And so this is a platform by which we can take the specialists to the rural communities that don't otherwise have that resource. When we come back, we'll be with Dr. Schneider with skin on. He's going to tell us more about the robot program and Missions Telehealth. Okay, you, you're here now. Yep. This is you. That, that is just the coolest thing. I have to say, after a few minutes, mm -hmm. you almost forget that it's not the person. Sure. I mean, it's not really that. When it first rolled in here, <coughs> I have to say it's a little freaky, uh, almost like a 70s TV mm -hmm. show. You did say something that I want, a couple of things I want to make sure that we, we talk about, the shortage of specialists. Mm -hmm. And Mission, it's just so wonderful that y'all can reach all of Western North Carolina with this technology, but the shortest of specialists. That is something that we're hearing more and more and more about, and it's not getting any better. It's not getting any better. Uh, we have an aging physician population. Uh, we have a number of physicians who are looking to retire early for various reasons, right. whether it's economics or policy change. Uh, we have a number of uh, 
uh, residency slots that don't get filled because there may be less interest in certain specialties, mm -hmm. uh, including neurology, which mm -hmm. has historically had difficulty filling slots. Mm -hmm. And um, it's only going to get worse in time. Right. So this really meets that need. With the technology, and as our population, uh, as these young people begin to get older who have grown up with cell phones and video, mm -hmm. this won't be weird. But quick care, quick quality care is really what, what y'all are after. And something that we uh, talked about off camera that I want the folks at home to know, that where we live is in the stroke belt. Mm -hmm. Who would have known? You know, we talk about the Bible belt, and, right. and I think our, our heart attacks around here are pretty prevalent, but stroke belt? That's I mean, right. And it doesn't all come from our age. It's just for one reason or another. Right. <coughs> we, we live in the stroke belt, and that just means there's a higher incidence of stroke in general and a, and a higher mortality rate, rate related to stroke in the southeast, basically, and that includes western North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And there are a number of, of studies that have looked at what are the causes of that, and it hasn't been fully determined, but certainly there are environmental factors such as what we eat, mm -hmm. our sedentary lifestyle, uh, obesity, <coughs> incidence of diabetes and hypertension, you know, maybe some of these risk factors that are readily treatable <coughs> aren't treated effectively either because of access to care or lack of access to care or just, you know, patient decisions about the kind of care that they want or what medicines they're willing to take or what can they afford and so forth. Right. And one of the things I know that y'all are working on and that one of the reasons we're here talking to you today is so people understand the fast, the, the uh, face, arms, smile, time. Time is right. incredibly important. Time is of the essence. Mm -hmm. For acute stroke treatment, um, we have something that we can use, a medicine that is a clot-busting medicine. So when you have a blockage, the sooner we can restore blood flow to the brain, the more likely that brain's going to survive. And so we have a medicine called TPA. It's a mm -hmm. clot-busting drug. Um, we, have, we use it within certain parameters, and the sooner we give it, the better. But above and beyond that, we also have some interventional uh, therapies that are very aggressive where we have one of our radiology colleagues who goes in at the groin artery with a catheter into the brain artery mm -hmm. and mechanically sometimes can actually remove the clot. And so everything that we're doing is focused on identifying the clot mm -hmm. and then figuring out what the best strategy for removing it to restore blood flow to the brain. And that's one of those reasons to get there fast, to get, get treatment as fast as possible. Right. Mm -hmm. Minutes lost is brain lost. And right. um, the sooner we can get a patient uh, evaluated and determine, mm -hmm. is it a stroke and can we mm -hmm. treat it effectively, um, the more likely we can save the brain from going on to have a completed injury that is then, uh, you know, a person may become disabled from. So we want to prevent that disability from happening with our emergent therapies. They're very time-dependent right. therapies. And how many do you see, did, does Mission see every year? We see approximately 1,200 strokes per year, and that's uh, of the, all the various types of strokes. Right. And that also includes here very locally, but across Western North Carolina, mm -hmm. patients that come here, we see about 1,200 per year. I think it's awesome. Thank you. Absolutely. Okay. I'm here with Christy, and we're going to talk about her experience with stroke, which is amazing. She and I have been talking just a little bit. You're going to just hang on. <laughs> so what I want you to explain, yes. and we're eventually going to get to tell a stroke in the robot and how that, how that worked with you. But first, I want okay. you to tell your story. Okay. Because as you can see, you're not 70. You're mm -hmm. not 80. No. You're not even 50. No, I've got you're a little ways to go. You're not even 40. You're <laughs> 80. Oh, my goodness. And you've had experience mm -hmm. with stroke. That's right. And we've heard a little bit about what stroke is, mm -hmm. but yours was completely different. Mm -hmm. Tell me what happened. Now, first, let's, let's go back just a little bit. Mm -hmm. What were your symptoms? How did you first know that you had anything wrong? Well, and my breathing problems to start with were part of the problem, but I didn't know I had anything wrong. So you had some breathing problems. Mm -hmm. I got up with my husband to get him ready for work, mm -hmm. decided I'd been trying to get over a cold, so I lay back down and get another couple hours of sleep. And at 10.30 in the morning, I woke up, and I noticed I couldn't, my eyes didn't want to open right. I didn't know why my eyes didn't want to open right. So I swung out of bed. I said, well, I'll get up. I'll go do what we all do in the morning. Oh, yeah. That'll help me wake up. And when I yeah. stood up, I fell to the floor because I had lost my right side. 
I had no, I had nothing on my right side. Mm. So I fell to the floor. <laughs> and of course, with a phone right there, I never thought to pick up the phone. I thought that I was having a bad morning and I'll take a nap and, and get over it. So I took a nap. Yeah. So I, I never had no idea it would be anything like that. Yeah. Um, so I took a nap. Yeah. And then I moved around enough to where I could get my, get my strength back and get out to a, a couch mm -hmm. out in the living room, and I fell asleep on the couch. Mm -hmm. um, but I never once thought about who to call, what else to do. I just thought I was having a bad morning. I had no idea what was actually going on. There was no pain at all. No pain. I was, I was not scared. I had no pain. I just thought I was having a bad morning. I was a little tired, and I thought I was and having a bad morning. we all have those mornings. We all do. Do we not? We when do. we feel a little off. You we know. do. Yeah. And my husband got home. Um, he found me on the couch in my PJs, and I could stand up and I could stretch, but I couldn't talk. I could say yes with my head and no with my head, you but I could not. You were clicking off all the yeah. signs of stroke right well, here. Well, and my face was still falling. There's I could stand, one. but my face was still falling. Still. But he's 40 years old. He's never seen a stroke, so he didn't know I was having a stroke. Um, so he had me get up and sit down and eat the lunch that he brought me, which was hysterical with food falling all over the place because it was coming out <laughs> of my mouth. you still haven't called mm -mm. anybody? We have no idea what's going on. Oh. Um, so my mother-in-law finally came over. Yeah. She was off, and she saw what was happening. She knew. So she helped me finish getting dressed. Um, she had to help me find my way outside because when I went to open the door, where I thought I was here, yeah. I was here. And I couldn't, my Change. perception, yeah, yeah, it was off. I couldn't figure out that I wasn't right where I was supposed to be. That's normal, too. Yeah. They got me dressed, got me outside, yeah. got me into the emergency room, which, of course, as soon as they saw my face, they had me back there in a second. Oh, they, yeah. There was no question <laughs> with it down oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. what was going on. And then what happened? Um, and then I was in, and I was still trying to figure out exactly why I was there. I didn't know why everybody was making such a big deal, because nothing hurt. Yeah. I wasn't sick to my stomach. I was fine. I didn't know what was going on. Yeah. Then I saw the robot come in. Thought for, uh -huh. a single, thought for just a minute there, I might have actually lost my mind, and that's why I was here, because here comes a robot. But he came in the room, and I could actually see Dr. Schneider's face right yeah. there on it. Did, did that, and I know that you were... Um, you were ha having, you were in the middle of a stroke when yeah. you were treated by the robot. Did that freak you out at all, though, to see the robot? If I would have seen him come in and I hadn't been in that shape, I'm th I would have probably w wondered a little bit more. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, even in that in that state, I just smiled when I saw it. Yeah. Because it, it it was the neatest little thing. Okay, just here it comes in the room, just yeah. right on in through the door, and yeah. of course everybody's talking to it and it's talking back to them. And mm -hmm. it took a minute with the brain confusion to understand that it was supposed to be there, right? Right. <laughs> and that everybody's allowed to talk to it. It's it's actually okay. Right. But to actually see his face, to hear his voice, mm -hmm. and to have all that put together. So when I got here, he's one of the first people I saw, and as soon as I saw him, I knew I know who that is. And you'd already seen him. I'd already seen him and I'd already heard his voice, so I already knew exactly who he was. Yep. I didn't really know, but I knew by his voice and his face that I knew who that was. Right. And then I talked to him before and it was okay before, so it's okay now. And then what happened? Well, he had asked me some questions, which of course I couldn't answer. Yeah. Um, everybody was asking questions. I just kind of looked at everybody like, hi, how you doing? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Smiled at everybody, half, half a smile. Um, but they talked, my husband to give me the shot. Mm -hmm. Um, got me on the, got me in the shot, um, and of course he talked to all of them more than me because I really couldn't understand what he was saying, yeah. um, and got me on a helicopter and got me up here to mission. So he assessed. Yes, yes. he did. He did. He was we right there. As soon as as soon as the doctor down there saw me and saw the shape I was in, he immediately went right straight in and called up here to the doctors to get the, the robot started. Go and take a look. Wow. So he did it right away. Mm -hmm. and, and you did go on the helicopter. Yes, I did. So you got to fly. I did. On I got to fly. Helicopter. That was yes. That was. And the back of it's really neat because you get to see everything. And the mountains are really pretty. <laughs> oh, that, <laughs> that is time neat. of day. <laughs> that is too yep. good. I hate you had to go through it, but hey, at least you got to do all the cool One stuff. One more experience. Put it right up there. I won't get it any other time. <laughs> That's right. We hope. <laughs> yeah. That. Yeah. Exactly. We're hoping. That's right. So they got you here. And then what has happened since then? Um, I've had a lot of fun um, getting picked on in a fun way by speech therapists <laughs> and all kinds of doctors. Um, it, there's been a lot to learn. I mean, my husband had to, to show me how to blow my nose again. I couldn't, my head was stuffed up yeah. and I didn't know how to fix it. So he told me to blow my nose. I didn't, I couldn't figure out to blow my nose. Um, I couldn't say anything. Um, they'd show me a picture with different things on it. Mm -hmm. um, the two ones I remember most were the key and the chair. Um, and they said, what it, do you know what that is? And I said, yeah. And they said, what is it? I couldn't say it. The word wouldn't come. Mm -mm. I knew what it was. I could tell you what it felt like. In my, in my mind, I could tell you what it felt like, how it felt to sit in one, what it felt like when you stood up from one. Yeah. I knew everything about a chair, but I couldn't say chair. Chair. I couldn't say it. Well, did, did they find out what caused your stroke? Because obviously you're young. Mm -hmm. uh, you said you've never smoked. Nope, never smoked. So. Um, with the, with the 
clotting factor, the, that pa factor five that my blood has. Right. It wants to clot anyway. So at some point, for some reason, we don't know why mm -hmm. I got the clots, but for some reason in my legs, I got some clots that got started. Mm -hmm. And they ended up going up into my lungs. Mm -hmm. And once I got settled in there with my, with my clot, issues right. they just kind of got bigger and bigger and bigger till the one broke loose mm -hmm. and the one that broke loose is the one that when it got up into my heart mm -hmm. um, and once it got into my heart um, it went through the hole in the middle of my heart mm -hmm. when it got to the other side of my heart that sent it straight up into my brain so my heart actually sent it and, and uh, none of these things you knew were going on none in of your body. I had no idea I had no idea I had, a, had the hole in my heart. I had no idea I had the blood condition. Right. I've always been he very healthy. I don't go but to the doctor's office for a physical, but every about five years. Yeah, and you look extremely healthy. I try to. You do. You look <laughs> extremely healthy. Otherwise, I am. I get. I exercise a lot, mm -hmm. and I eat horrible food. I'm a. <laughs> I'm a junk food junkie, but okay. otherwise, I've always been very, very healthy. Yeah. Um, but this one happened anyway. It didn't wow. help me out on this one. Wow, <laughs> and that's what the folks home. That's why we're doing this. You need to hear that you're, you're young, you're active, you're out there, and you needed to know the I signs of stroke. I would have loved to have any idea mm -hmm. what to expect when you're having a stroke because I might have been able, even if I could have just picked up the phone and called my husband and just hit a number. Yes. I couldn't talk, just hit a number to let him know something was wrong. Yeah. It could, I could have gotten help quicker, but I had no idea what was happening. Yeah. If I would have known, yeah. I, I, I would have done something quicker. Yeah. Well, thank you. You're welcome. No problem. Stay with us. Okay, we've learned fast. I just want to do it one more time. Face, got to look at their face. Does that look normal? See if they can raise their arms. Is their speech slurred? And what was that T? That T was time, and that's where we're going next. Sometimes, like the doctors and the nurses and everything you've heard today, you've got to get there fast. And sometimes an ambulance is just not fast enough. So what does Mission do? They'll send Mama. I'm here outside. It may be a little noisy, but we're going to talk loud. Uh, behind me, you'll see a lot of ambulances, but I'm here with a real star. This is one of the flight nurses from Mission, who when you see Mama go over, many times you're in that helicopter going <laughs> over. And we're going to talk about that for just a second, so hang with us. So Barbara, many times, like I just told you a few minutes ago, I'll be out in the county and we'll see a helicopter go over and we know there goes Mama. But many people don't really understand what you guys on MAMA do. You're, you're going to something, somebody calls you. Tell me a little bit about what it is you do. What we do pretty much is just provide medical care um, to either trauma patients or people that are critically ill or injured. Mm -hmm. It can be wrecks. It can be anything from bicycle accidents to motorcycle accidents to somebody that can't breathe or has heart problems or have strokes anything like that. Right, and thank you for that lead-in because just a few minutes ago we heard Christy tell us that she was out in Franklin, had had a stroke, and they needed to get her here fast. Mm -hmm. And so instead of sending an ambulance this way, they called Mama, and y'all went and got her. Mm -hmm. So in that instance, like what happens? Like in those Pretty days? much what we do, we get dispatched from our communication. Somebody calls them, they dispatch us, mm -hmm. and we uh, there's two aircraft, so the one in Franklin would have responded, mm -hmm. um, and they are pretty much there at the hospital. Um, they would have come, they would have assessed her, um, seen what the hospital did, mm -hmm. and pretty much what we do is load the patient up, mm -hmm. keep them as comfortable as possible, mm -hmm. um, so that if they don't, they, we don't want them to get air sick. Um, we want them to stay relaxed as much as possible. Um, and we monitor them the whole way back to Asheville. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's a much speedier way to get here. Absolutely. The idea is the fast trip here so that the neurosurgeons can work and do what they need to do for the right. patient. Like we heard Dr. Schneider say, time is of the essence. And that's what the aircraft is all about, is saving time. Right, and you that's guys are a key to that time saving. We try. Yeah. Well, we and try. I will say, she paid you a great compliment. She said they were so they made me so comfortable and relaxed. I just That's forgot key. I was flying. Um, in flying, I mean, you know, somebody with a stroke, you don't want them t to get airsick. You right. want to make sure their blood pressure stays down. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of that is, I mean, it may be hand holding, it may be medications, mm -hmm. it may be just reassurance to the patient. But the whole idea is a fast trip. Right. 
And that's key in what you guys do. Yes. I mean, that's 99% of what we're used for, right. the fact that we are faster. Right. And this is one thing that uh, we wanted to make sure that we told the folks at home, is it in between the time that, let's say, somebody uh, calls EMS, like one of these ambulances behind us, uh, and gets that, that person there, what should the person assisting the person in trouble, let's say, with a stroke, is there anything they can do in the meantime to assist you? Usually, if it's somebody at a residence and they call 911, usually the dispatchers can walk them through um, and help them um, as far as what they need to do till EMS gets there. Right. Um, once EMS gets there, they will go ahead and assess the patient, um, see what they've got, and then they make the call. EMS many, many times calls us right. for a possible code stroke and then we'll go ahead and leave and go get the patient and bring the patient back. Right, um, and then that person assisting could make sure they have all their medicines and, and, and yeah. kind of necessary Any paperwork. Kind of, yeah, it, it's a great, great help if you know history, if you know allergies, if you know medications the patient's on, some sort of information, even if it's the demographic part, knowing somebody's right. name, address, you know, uh, who to contact in case right. of an emergency, it is huge. Right. Because a lot of times we get here and we have no information. Right. And, and again, it's really important. That slows that time down. Yes. Anything yes. you can do to get that treatment faster. Correct. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Stay tuned. We hope you've enjoyed this segment of Funkum Life. We want to spend it, send out special thanks to Mission Health for all their help with it. Their information is always wonderful. And as always, we hope that we've reminded you of something you've forgotten or taught you something that you didn't know that you can use in your life here in Buncombe County. And stay healthy until next time with Buncombe Life.